Happy Thursday, third day of Dallas Startup Week. Uh, I'm Fiona Schlachter. I'm actually with Health Wildcatters, uh, but I'm doing the intro for on behalf of the Dallas Startup Week team. Uh, we want to welcome you to the session of our Thursday Pulse with uh, Dr. Romero Rivas. We're excited. And with Jack Cooper from uh, Take Command Health. He's going to give us an overview of his startup. Uh, first of all, we want to thank our sponsors for Dallas Startup Week, Chase, Downtown Dallas, Bella Wood, Touch Titans, Dev Mountain, Circles and Kratos, and a special thanks to 1700 Pacific for this awesome room. We're excited about it. So uh, we'll look forward and we'll just get started right now with Dr. Zajcek. Thank you. Good morning. All right. How do you like the new digs? This is, this is our, our, uh, our first time. Uh, and probably the only time we'll be here this year. Um, so welcome to uh, The Pulse, and we rolled this into Dallas Startup Week this, uh, this April, and thought that would be a, a good combination of the two. A couple things we, we want to run through here. For any of those who don't know uh, me, my name is Hubert Zajcik, I run Health Wildcatters. Uh, the Pulse Breakfast Series is a monthly series around healthcare innovation that we have um, uh, duh, every month, and uh, except for, <laughs> it's, it's early, <laughs> double that coffee. Did somebody sneak some decaf in there? <laughs> Come on, that's evil. All right, um, uh, in any case, so if you don't know, uh, find it on our website, sign up for it. Uh, those of you who signed up for Eventbrite, Eventbrite, yes, know that we uh, like Eventbrite, and uh, I hate to say it, but we like functioning sign-up uh, mechanisms. That's why the Eventbrite stayed uh, up, and uh, I think over 100 people signed up for Eventbrite. Uh, the other alternative wasn't so great. And uh, we'll stay with Eventbrite and others. Um, that way, you'll have a name tag. So this is what we uh, always promise you. We promise to get you out by 9 o'clock. Today, it'll be actually 8.55, because there's session in this room at 9. So um, it's Oren, Oren Salmon that has a session here. He's a friend. Um, but I think if I, if I drag it on to 8.50, 7.58, that friendship may be, <laughs> may be under, under duress. So uh, let's try it. We're shooting for 8.55. But um, Dr. Rivas promised to uh, not damage my friendships around town. So uh, we will show you um, a, a startup, a local startup, that will present a five-minute pitch. And then we'll be on to uh, our uh, main presenter today. We want to thank our sponsor, Page Sutherland Page, that underwrites the Paul's Breakfast series. And Josh Theodore is here, and Jim Kilbrew, and Pete Winters. Anybody else from Page? Uh, they and I don't know your name, so now I'm. Just... <laughs> Beth Carroll. Carol. All right. So thank you guys for uh, helping underwrite this series. And um, if you need any, have any space needs in the healthcare architectural world uh, and engineering world, uh, see any of those folks, and they, they can help you out. They did some of the coolest, they do some of the coolest projects uh, uh, around town and around uh, the country and beyond. I understand. So uh, you've met uh, Fiona Schachter. Uh, you have not met Christy Torres over there. Uh, so our, our team here, there are Twitter handles. My phone was taken away from me, so we can be live streaming on Periscope and Facebook and YouTube. Not Facebook. Uh, in any case, if you've been texting me the last hour, there's no chance I would return your text or give you any help in finding us here because we're Periscoping. Many thanks to our Pulse volunteers. I've got Ryan over here, Faraz, our intern, and um, got many of the DSW volunteers here as well, so and are helping us out. It's been great to have this. We have this series um, usually at our place, and the next one will again be at our place. But uh, if you want to join as a Pulse member, you actually buy a subscription for the whole year, and you see. Uh, the persons with the orange bar underneath the tag are the people that have signed up for the whole year. And this is a membership that gives you a few extra perks. So if we run out of seats, you will never not have a seat. Uh, we can also give you preferred seating at pitch day and other events. So it uh, helps us kind of predict who will come and uh, plan out the year. 
these are our, some of the organizations we support around town. This is not a complete list, but the Health Technology Forum, Health 2 Dallas, Society of Physician Entrepreneurs Dallas Chapter, BioNorth Texas, all have events. We have a monthly newsletter and uh, share uh, all, the in, all the events that um, we're uh, informed about to let you know. And uh, amongst the four objectives here this morning is for you to meet each other, number one. Number two, for you to get an update from us what's happening uh, around healthcare innovation events in Dallas in the next month. Number three, to see a cool startup present. Number four, to meet an uh, uh, amazing person that will give you some insights in health innovation. Those are our four objectives. So number two is the calendar. Uh, we, these are also on our website, but of course, uh, there's an event, I guess today, at the Cancer Brain uh, Institute. There is uh, the, uh, our wearables panel on, that's tomorrow, uh, here as part of Dallas Work um, Startup Week. And then a wearables workshop on Saturday. You can bring your kids. There'll be Misfit and Samsung and... Dr. Oh, oh, and Dr. Rivas is on the wearables panel. Uh, then there's an event, uh, I think that's in Austin, yeah. Beginning of May, uh, that is a, a venture and, and healthcare investment event. We've got one in, in, in Houston on the 17th, which is kind of cool, a bunch of Chinese investors and startups coming to Texas all around. Um, a lot of them are around the life sciences. BioNorth Texas has a breakfast on the 19th, and then if you don't know, the Dallas Entrepreneur Center is a great resource around town uh, to help you um, connect and meet others, and they've got a ton of events as well. Not necessarily healthcare related, but uh, startup related. So now, without further ado, we have five minutes, and he knows what happens when he goes over, because he's seen it. He's seen it. He's seen it. <laughs> Jack Hooper. Thanks, Hubert. Great. Uh, well, thank you all for having me today, and uh, uh, Health Wildcatters, and Dallas Startup Week, and. Uh, my name is Jack Cooper. I'm the founder of Take Command Health. Take Command Health is, is a website and app that empowers individuals to be smart health insurance consumers. The first decision people face is, well, which health plan do I choose? Uh, for me and my wife, a little about three and a half years ago, I was starting grad school. We had just quit our jobs, moved across the country, had a nice one-bedroom uh, efficiency apartment in downtown Philadelphia and uh, we're blessed but very, very, very surprised with a twin pregnancy. Uh, as you can imagine, on student loans, trying to decide which health plan do I choose is, is pretty cumbersome. Turns out a lot of folks, uh, when they're looking at health plans, have questions. You know, is my doctor gonna be on this plan? Is the prescription I take on the plan? Uh, maybe if you're managing a chronic condition or a serious illness, you wanna understand how the plan's gonna work with, with the care that you need. The reality is, is healthcare.gov and a lot of existing websites out there, they do a great job of letting you put in a zip code and, and look at 50 plans. But when you're just sorting by premium and, and deductible, you're not really answering the questions that you need. In fact, research shows that 88% uh, of people actually choose the wrong plan based on their known conditions, and it costs them over $500 a year in excess medical expenses. ACA is driving the need uh, for individual support as well. Uh, more people will be choosing an individual health plan. So individuals are people not with a company uh, that are, are pursuing their own policy. It's gonna triple in the next few years from pre-ACA rates. Take Command Health is a simple, step-by-step, TurboTax-like interview uh, that helps walk the consumer through the process. The first thing we do is try to help the consumer understand the full breadth of the options available to them. Uh, where most sites will just have on exchange or healthcare.gov plans, some will have off exchange. Uh, our database actually has all of those as well as some faith-based plans that are ACA compliant. As far as I know, we're the only website in the country right now that offers a full view of, of the options available. The next thing we do is help the consumer dive deeper into the plans to understand what's there. Uh, two years ago, I believe we were the first to release a, a universal doctor search, where if you're Dr. or Dr. Smith, uh, you can enter them into our site, uh, kind of a Google search bar and we'll tell you which plans he or she will participate on in the next year. Uh, we do the same thing with prescriptions, and we have a really cool database uh, uh, where, for example, if you tell me you're a 
type 2 diabetic that's well managed, or if you're a grad student uh, expecting twins, we pull from millions of actual healthcare transactions and process those through the plans and give you an estimate, excuse me, uh, help you with some analysis and data uh, to see how, it, how each plan would perform for you. Finally, we make enrollment super easy, and along the way, we're giving you great advice in plain language, not leaving, leaving you with a list of plans to choose from. Uh, Take Man Health is two years old. I'm, uh, it's been a part-time endeavor for me and my partner. I'm uh, proud to say I left my full-time management consulting uh, job about six weeks ago, kind of close to here, so I make sure no one's in the, uh, in the crowd. Now I get to be a full-time entrepreneur. Uh, Throughout this phase, we've, we've really been bootstrapping and trying to kind of prove a revenue and acquisition model that works with individuals. Um, pleased to say that in two years, we've dramatically reduced our cost of acquisition uh, to such that it's much lower than even a traditional broker going after large groups now. We're also retaining members at a much higher rate as well. I think this is because we're providing much better plan advice, so the plan actually fits and works for the individual. Uh, our greatest referral source was friends, which is awesome to see. And if you're familiar with the net promoter score, we've worked really hard to position ourselves as kind of the unbiased, data-driven ally uh, to a consumer looking for a health plan, and have been able to separate from how people view uh, their health insurance company. What makes Take Command Health different uh, is really building our business model from the ground up to win with individuals. Most of the websites you see or services offered are uh, were traditionally built for groups. So they're kind of individuals are an add-on or an extra burden or opportunity. Uh, and we're really focused on winning from them from the ground up. Uh, so I showed earlier, it's gonna be the fastest growing market uh, for health insurance. Uh, the first, we stick to three main things. The first being scalable. Uh, one thing we don't have is a call center. Uh, we intentionally took our website, or our phone number off our website because we wanted users to get used to doing it on their own, kind of a do-it-yourself do it TurboTax-like model. The next thing, though, is we want to be sticky uh, and provide great customer service, even if we're not picking up the phone. We're really trying, instead of competing on price, we're really selling good advice. Sounds, sounds pretty good. Uh, uh, and relying on retention moving forward. Finally, heavily innovation focused. Uh, we want to be leveraging technology and data and tools over manpower to serve our clients. We have some really exciting growth opportunities. Uh, one is just geographic. We were only in Texas the last two years. We have some great ideas for offering premium services and, and data for our members. And what I'm really excited about engaging this room with is what I call our channel partnerships. We've already started white labeling versions of our sites for school districts, uh, talking with health systems and pharmacies in the area, trying to leverage our technology and really go where a advisor or broker, uh, a traditional broker uh, can't. Uh, where can we take this advice engine and deploy it in strategic locations to help people along the way? I mentioned it's me and my partner, Matt. I'm pleased to say we're just days away from closing our initial seed funding round, so pretty excited about that. And uh, thank you. Looking to make some key hires. So if you are a developer, I think there are like unicorns around here, but uh, if, if you're out there, uh, we have money and a job for you. Uh, we're also looking for people with experience in social media, user interface design, uh, product design and development. Um, I should mention as well, we are excited about our board of advisors and the uh, depth and experience they bring. We're still looking to round out that group too. So I know a lot of folks here are, are well connected in the health industry. I'm excited to get more plugged in. I'd, I'd love to talk to you too if, if you think you'd be interested in helping that way. I think I'm near my time. I just want to round up. We've, we've been really pleased with the feedback we've gotten. Uh, the Dallas community has been incredibly supportive. Uh, we were Health 2.0 finalists in a plan choice competition and uh, received some great publications here in Dallas uh, as well as nationally. So thank you very much. I, I think I need to turn it back over, but would love to connect with you if, if uh, there's, there's interest or connections or, or ideas to be shared at the presentation. <laughs> All right, thank you. I think we're going to swap over here. I've got one housekeeping item, and that is, let me get this here. 
Uh, we, we always announce our new members of the, um, the Pulse. And let's see, Jim Fowler. Jim Fowler here. Thomas John. And it's right, Thomas, Thomas John, right? OK. And Akil Deshpande. Akils. So th those are our three newest uh, Pulse members. Um, and I failed to mention that earlier. Anybody I missed? Because there might be another couple of people that snuck in. Jack, you joined. You joined uh, as well since the last poll. So Jack and anybody else? OK. Um, so anyway, thank you for your support. It uh, means a great deal to us because it allows us to underwrite as well these breakfasts. Now it is my distinct pleasure to um, introduce my, my personal friend and um, used to be Dallasite. Uh, but he left us for the left coast, um, uh, Dr. Romero Rivas. Uh, Dr. Rivas was on faculty here at UT Southwestern when I was as well, and uh, then uh, got an MBA at SMU, um, and that's how we met. Uh, he is a surgeon by trade uh, in, in bariatric surgery. He's assistant assistant professor at, uh, at Stanford. Uh, he is also director of, I wrote this down to get it exactly right, and now I blank, surgical innovation at Stanford. Oh, yeah, that would have helped, director of innovative surgery, so I still got that wrong. Uh, but uh, also, we'll tell, I'll tell you, is uh, just an amazing person. He's been, I thought, just been gone for a couple of years, but it turns out he's, he left six years ago. He's a, a mentor in health wildcatters. He's passionate about M health and many things that have to do with innovation, not just surgery, uh, and is just a, a, a delight for me to have him back here in town. And let's give him a, a great welcome. So uh, it's a great honor, pleasure to be here. Um, it's been a few years, and I really miss Dallas. Uh, I think there's uh, great opportunities of uh, innovation, uh, especially here in Dallas. I have nothing to disclose, <laughs> and I want to make it go real fast. I could spend all day talking about this thing. I'm very passionate about it. I think physicians, we are very um, old-fashioned. We don't really, we're not very good innovators for that matter. And just the key things to talk about. Yes, the key things to talk about is why the business model of medicine is extremely uh, inefficient, very poor, very old-fashioned. What are the characteristics, the features of a, a, a successful innovation, the profile of a successful innovator, and uh, how is that we can you know, leverage on digital health and ICTs to make it happen. Uh, innovation is something that you know, every uh, new title that's going to have, People overuse this word. Uh, certainly here in the US, we believe, we feel that we have the best healthcare in the whole world. We actually are, have probably the most inefficient one there is in the, uh, uh, in the Western, I mean, in the uh, Occidental type of uh, countries. We do have a crisis when it comes to uh, healthcare expenses, uh, nearly. Uh, 20% of our GDP uh, goes to healthcare. Um, in, in the case of surgery, for that matter, let's put it, but in general in medicine, there's been lots of innovations throughout the last you know, 20, 30 years. That capsule uh, that you take, it takes thousands of pictures when you swallow that capsule, robotic surgery, where you can have a, an operating procedure at, at a distance. Uh, now we do surgery through the mouth, through other orifices, so we don't really have to do a scar. Um, we can do very complex operations by putting needles, like, like getting an access to a vessel and doing like uh, an aneurysm for that matter, uh, repair. But we still have a very inefficient, a very poor business model that hasn't changed in thousands of years. And what that is, is that we depend, we rely on physicians to actually take care of that one-on-one -on -one, uh, basis. So it's very artisanal. So I could be in the operating, you know, I trained for 15 years more or less, and I could be in the operating room all day working hard and maybe do five cases, maybe 10 cases if I, you know, push it real hard. 
but the social impact that my practice of 50 years, 15 years will have, it's only of five families, five people. That's about it. So it's very inefficient. By teaching other people, I believe that I can just expand myself, but it's, it's very uh, romantic to think that way. So by leveraging on uh, ICTs or information and communication technologies, that's the only way we can actually scale healthcare. There's places in the world, like in India, where you can have open heart surgery for less than $1,000. That's never, ever going to happen here, never. So the only way how we can actually surpass this big challenge is by, as I said, leveraging on information and communication technologies. And no innovation will you know, be uh, universally adoptable unless it makes good economic sense. Everyone has a cell phone. You know, every morning when you leave home, there are three things that you always check. You, you got to have your keys, you got to have your wallet, and you got to have your cell phone. If you don't have your keys or your wallet, probably you're going to do fine. But if you don't have your cell phone, you're going to be completely dead. <laughs> so uh, things that make something, uh, you know, uh, successful and innovation, it has to be something very simple, something that you don't have to think about it, something that makes sense, something that it's uh, certainly cost effective and that everyone's going to have. Those are the things like, like the cell phone that, you know, they become a, a, an innovation. Uh, promising technologies that we have in digital health, certainly like what is called mHealth, uh, telemedicine, uh, certainly the use of uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, 3D printing, and even uh, what we call you know, drones and um, artificial intelligence for that matter. But we go back, we have to go back to the basics, especially for entrepreneurs. How is that you're going to make your company successful? And you need to think about your end customer. In this case, it will be the patient. There's not going to be someone who's more concerned about their health, but their patients themselves. Uh, physicians, we really care about them, but you know, we're, they, they care more, them, more about themselves than anyone else. And nowadays, you can have, like, you know, off the shelf, you can go and buy it online, or you can buy it pretty much any place. Lots of devices that implement ICTs, for that matter, to bring healthcare to home or to wherever the patient may be. And I'm just going to run through many of those things. This is just so, to get your blood pressure. Uh, there are devices like the Alive Core that you can actually just with your phone, you can get real uh, FDA approved uh, EKG tracing of your heart. You can tweet it, you can share it, you can you know, put alarms, you can do anything, very inexpensive. You can have a patch where you can have pretty much a mini ICU like with you all the time. It makes sense, economic sense for entrepreneurs because it's something that you have to change every day uh, and it's still very low, low cost. They're devices that are so simple, yet they give very sophisticated information. This will give you information to your cardiologist, even what we call cardiac output or stroke volume, meaning how much volume your heart is actually pumping every second. Uh, there are other ones that are not FDA approved yet, like this Scanadu, but it can give you a number of things. It gives you a number of reads. This is, this is mine. And it gives me my blood pressure, oxygen level, and a number of things. And it takes them to the cloud so I can actually track this information myself. The, all these things make sense more than anything for, for example, development of uh, massive like clinical trials where patients don't have to go back to see the physicians and they can actually upload the information themselves without even noting every day. The medication adherence market. You could diagnose someone with diabetes, you can reduce diabetes rate, you can do all those things, but a lot will depend on patients taking a medication. Well, the medication adherence market represents 300 to 350 billion US dollars. So if you as an entrepreneur can come up with a way how patients will remember how to take their drugs, you're going to make lots of money for that matter. This is an implantable device, FDA approved, that you can place in pills. When you take it, you swallow as a patient, you have a device, a transducer that you're wearing with you, and it identifies that you have actually taken this medication, and then it tweets it, you know, it sends it to your physician or whatever. It will also let people know that you're not taking the medication or not. There's going to be sensors like patches for pretty much any disease, especially chronic disease. This is something that has algorithms for asthma patients that when you increase the heart rate or respiratory rate, it will trigger an algorithm that it will say, likely you're going to get an asthma attack. You better take your inhaler. 
There's also things just for simple things like just to check your temperature and pretty much for any body function that you can imagine. So this has developed a movement that is not just local, for example, Silicon Valley. This is a global movement of what is called the quantify self or quantify selfers. People who actually track and they uh, share all information of their vi vital functions and every single thing they do uh, throughout the day. Uh, it could be for elite athletes, it's, even though I'm, I'm just a, you know, an avid runner, uh, you know, I have a, a vest that it's, it can track all my respiratory volumes and my heart rate and a number of things, and it's very low cost. If you like fashion, you can have it in your belt. Uh, you can have jewelry that certainly measures your activity. You can have a number of other things. This is for people not to eat too fast because you're moving your jaw. It identifies you're eating too fast, likely too much and it will give you uh, some advice of not doing it that way. Obesity market, I mean, that's, uh, that's what I do every day. We don't have enough very, you know, there's like 70% uh, of Americans are overweight, 20 million people are morbidly obese. We have only less than 2,000 bariatric surgeons. I could be all day in the operating room and never finish in my whole life uh, patients, so we need to find ways how we can leverage ICTs to actually do this. Now, Everyone has a cell phone, everyone has a smartphone, everyone has a camera, everyone takes so many pictures. Uh, we certainly should leverage on things like that. This is a simple, very simple device for autistic uh, children where they really cannot engage eye-to-eye -eye contact, where you can just create a tracing uh, on the phone. They actually helps them uh, come up with uh, you know, uh, eye-to-eye -eye engagement. There's another one, there's a company called Ginger IO. It, it actually spies in your phone. So patients who actually have, uh, they're psychotic. They have a higher in index of uh, becoming suicidal from time to time. So what the, the software does, it's just simple software, when they become suicidal, these patients, they start making lots of wrong calls. They, they just call wrong numbers. And so the software identifies that they're doing that and it, it triggers a mechanism saying this guy's gonna be suicidal. And there's actually a p-value rate, meaning a statistical value, that it makes uh, clinical sense to use software like this. Uh, certainly you could come up with any sort of evaluation from seeing very sophisticated uh, eye evaluation, doing ear evaluation uh, in the in-ear by just adapting something to your cell phone. There's already a number of different companies with the very, you have to have a very innovative business model. And the way that, for example, this, this is a company called Cellscope, this is out of the Bay, uh, where they avoid all the FDA regulations and, and, and barriers that you may have is because they cater to the end customer, which is the patient. The, the patients can choose to take photographs of the inner side of the, you know, the inner ear, and they can uh, choose to share them with their physician. That is not a medical device per se. It's just a way how they can take a picture and then share it with, with someone. You can actually identify because you have high resolution images with someone uh, who knows something about medicine, and they can actually say, well, this is a, an ear infection, take this medication without the need of you actually going to the office or doing things like that. I'm a, a, you know, I'm a digestive surgeon. I'm very passionate about technologies in the operating room. You, usually an endoscopic system costs you know, about $100,000. And it's like a big thing. It has lots of devices and things like that. Well, we don't actually need it anymore. You could actually do endoscopic laparoscopic surgery with a simple device such as a cell phone. In this case, an iPhone. You just put a high resolution lens you connect it into your, you know, with your endoscopic device, and then you can actually perform a very sophisticated surgery with, with very limited uh, cost. Um, now, there's, you know, I could speak all day about things, so I'm, I'm keeping it very short, but there's a huge opportunities with 3D printing. 3D printing has got, gone in all industries. Uh, anywhere from uh, creating dresses, uh, printing food, uh, furniture, or a number of other things. When it comes to healthcare, we actually have been using 3D printing for quite a while. Think about all the dentists, they use all this Invisalign, that's a, a clear way. Uh, about probably 25% of adults older than, 
40, they would have some type of implants uh, in their teeth by that age. And certainly a great percentage of all the ones who would have the need for even more sophisticated implants. But there's a great opportunity avoiding uh, regulation, for example, from FDA and from other regulators with the use of 3D printing in medical education, in surgical planning, uh, et cetera. Prosthetics is going to be a, a, a big thing. Uh, certainly with implants, you can do highly, highly customized because usually when you go to the operating room, you replace a hip. Uh, you have sizes like, you know, small, large, extra large, you know, things like that. Well, you can actually get the exact size from your patient uh, by uh, implementing algorithms that will go into your 3D printer. And I believe, I predict within a few years from now, every single operating room will have a 3D printer in the operating room so you can actually print many of the things you will need. Certainly, you can you know, customize to patients for their you know, fashion, their needs. You can do things that are low cost. This is from Palestine region, from the Gaza area, where people actually, for pennies, they're doing printing uh, uh, stethoscopes or needle drivers or even oximeters uh, for very simple things. You, there will be a time you get into the emergency room, you get your x-ray, you get your scan. It scans into the 3D printer, and it prints a low uh, weight, uh, low temperature, low pressure uh, sort of splint that is going to be 3D printed. This is out of Toronto, where people can actually bioprint um, skin grafts. So you actually you know, have no need to actually do skin graft from, from other areas, and you can just get it from your, from, from, your, from your 3D printer. This is fascinating. This is, this is the first drug. This is called Apricia. This is for uh, seizures that has been 3D printed. You would think, why would I care about you know, 3D printing any drugs? Well, the logistics are going to change dramatically. Just like um, there's, uh, the US Postal Service has this thing, this campaign that says, if it fits, it ships. They are planning to do something that is called, if it prints, it ships. So at some point, there's not going to be any sort of centers for things. You just print it at a place. And, but this, this drug, it has a, a more rapid bioability. And patients actually will have likely more chance of uh, truly um, uh, you know, taking the medication more than not. Now, what is really fascinating is actually creating also some social uh, you know, value propositions. There's lots of people who don't have an upper extremity or a lower extremity from an amputation, or they just were born without a limb. Uh, a, an entrepreneur, more, more like a social entrepreneur, decided, what can I do with this? He created a truly functional uh, arm, upper extremity, and then uh, a movement has been created throughout the world where they have a website. You can actually upload your information. My, you know, I'm like this weight, this height. I need my right upper extremity because I don't have it. It's going to be this length. And you can actually download the blueprints uh, for this extremity and for pennies. You know, I mean, less than $100 of paying what you need the, uh, to print it. You can actually get it printed. Otherwise, it will be like $100,000 or more. Uh, there's going to be some bioprinting available, hopefully, so that will reduce the need for transplants and for other things. We have certainly very sophisticated now imaging uh, techniques where we can do things, and we can actually create and um, extract out of the software, for example, the hip or any sort of implant that you can think about, and then you can actually this send to either a virtual reality, you know, you can email it to a patient, for example, so they can see it in a, a virtual reality environment, or you can actually 3D print it uh, so people can have a better surgical planning. For example, this woman had a retroorbital, like behind the eye, she had a, a tumor that the, the surgeon, the, the craniofacial surgeon said, well, you're going to likely have to lose the eye. The, the, uh, the uh, husband of this patient said, wait, 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 why don't we just like 3D print the, the CT scan of my wife and see how we can do this better. They did that. They were able to do some better surgical planning, how to approach that, that mass. And where the finger of that patient, you know, where, where the, that finger is, that's where the mass was. And this is after her surgery. So there's a lot of value. Now, you would think, well, that's a rare thing. But there are things like, for example, going in, into surgery, having uh, general anesthesia every day, 
we have to intubate your trachea. Uh, that can be sometimes difficult, and sometimes there's some emergency intubations, and people cannot be safely intubated. You can actually do some 3D printing of the airway, and you can actually plan how to put, you know, certainly the intubation on that patient, and that has great, great value. There are a number of other things, wearables in the operating room. We were just chatting about a, a few things How In a, a sterile environment, I really cannot touch anything. I cannot go to the computer. I cannot do things. And you could just have, this is a, a myoelectric uh, wearable that you have in your forearm. And by moving your uh, extremity, it causes some changes that a transducer can read. And then you can actually, um, this will take some time, but you can actually, with gestures, open up your computer and, you know, like change the slides that you want to see and see x-rays and, and move them around and, and just by doing that. So you don't really have to uh, scrub um, out of your case to actually do that. Now, virtual reality, we have several different senses. We have the sense of uh, sight, hearing, smell, and touch. We as physicians, as surgeons, we really can rely on all of those. Uh, certainly, this is something that has been present for, you know, hundreds of years. It's nothing new. Uh, and the use of stereoscopy, that means you have the same picture, you put it twice, uh, but a different, in different reception. That's going to give you the 3D sensation that you have. And this is something as simple as this device that most of us had uh, growing up. Uh, and the same thing you could actually do with uh, healthcare environments, with uh, many of the already uh, things that we have, and you can implement it in a uh, gamer device, such as Oculus, for example, where you can actually get, remember about those uh, um, uh, imaging, um, a, that imaging video I showed you about some, like a hip and, and things like that, I said you can extract out of that. You can bring it into something like this, you can put it in two different depths, and then you give the patient or the surgeon or the medical student or whoever that may be, an environment or, or virtual reality. That company, by the way, Oculus Rift, was a phenomenal success for entrepreneurs in the Bay. They put a campaign, I think it was on Kickstarter. They asked for $200,000, they got $2 million. Facebook looked at that, they thought like, those guys must have a fantastic value proposition. They pay the company, they bought the company for $2 billion, sorry. For $2 billion. So what they did is, uh, it was phenomenal. Well, Google, a, a French surgeon from Google said, you know, that's great, but how stupid. I mean, those guys from Facebook, they, they just wasted $2 billion. This is something we can do just by uh, putting a piece of cardboard. And that's what he developed, a piece of cardboard that you can actually buy on Amazon for $5. Uh, and it gives you the same sort of uh, perception that you can have with virtual reality, which is fascinating. I actually have implemented that. You could do it in the operating room with uh, some of my trainees, or you can do it with patients, you can do it with many things. But the key here is to have a good connection with technologies from software developers, uh, entrepreneurs, and with physicians, so you can bring simple value propositions that you may have in technology to actually healthcare. People have been using over the years, this is actually from Mexico, where people are doing some wound uh, complex you know, dressing change in the operating room, and to distract the patient, they actually are using virtual reality, so the patient's actually playing a game, doing something, and they're requiring less uh, anesthesia, less pain medication, et cetera. There are a number of other devices, certainly more sophisticated, implementing engines of artificial intelligence like Glass. Glass was just a prototype. Certainly, a lot, there was a lot of hype about it. Uh, but still, it has created a new movement where there's lots of new head-mounted displays that do more sophisticated things. You can certainly implement uh, EMR, electronic medical records, into your glass, into your head-mounted display. So you can actually do things at a distance, patients in the field, the, you know, the paramedic are seeing them, they send the, the evaluation to the emergency room where they can actually be waiting for the patient. And then it can be sent to a, a third provider if needed. Think about a, a, a class like this or being with a patient. Sometimes I can only bring two or three people in the clinic room to see a patient with me. Well, I could share that with a hundred. I could share that with a thousand, with you know, as many people. 
all the things that we do in, in the hospital, they, most of them, they require a TV screen by now. You can certainly leverage on a device like this to uh, you know, create that and bring that to the masses. Uh, we certainly use it for uh, safety checklists it's in the operating room, where we actually, usually there's a lot of uh, wrong site uh, surgeries, there's a lot of uh, mistakes in surgery, and this g gives us a checklist that until after we have gone through the whole checklist, we get a green light and we can say we have it. We certainly can implement uh, what is called augmented reality, creating a software in front of you so it can tell you how to do the operation with giving you, it's like a cheat sheet that the patient doesn't even have you reading a cheat sheet because it's telling you in front of you how to do things. Uh, wearables are in every single aspect of our life. They're going to be, you know, invading us in many ways. They're going to be also implantables. There's, this is, will not run this video, but it's a very interesting video that you can actually, more than just seeing augmented reality, seeing it in front of you, can actually interact. There's a, a, a small startup out of the Bay called uh, Athir Labs, and you can actually, you know, I have those glasses with one finger, I can bring an x-ray, I can make it bigger, I can say, well, I have enough of that, get the vital signs, do a number of things, but this is how classrooms are gonna be. We need a blockbuster like this, like we had in uh, photography, uh, in social media. We need to implement that in medicine so we can actually bring that to the masses. Drones, they make lots of sense in the future. Dallas can have a lot of traffic, uh, you know, uh, lots of major cities in the US. Uh, if you get a, you have your personal wearable, you have, uh, you're getting a heart attack, uh, it senses that your heart rate is going down or is going up or whatever, it sends a trigger to your personal drone, the drone will fly to where you are, it bypasses all the traffic, all the needs, it drops you, it gives you an aspirin, or it gives you a way how you can get a defibrillator and it will save your life. Certainly we will have barrier of adoptions, the biggest one, and I'm telling you as, as a, as a member of those, is going to be the changing the mindset of physicians. That is the biggest thing. That's why I advise entrepreneurs to actually target end customers, in this case patients, more than regulators, more than administrators, more than physicians, uh, but to actually target patients. Um, certainly doing everything open source, that's the difference of a, a successful innovator and a successful physician. If physicians were very risk averse, we never like to go through risk, we keep it very safe, so we never innovate, and so that's how we can uh, do things. We're gonna have uh, in next June a uh, meeting in, uh, we have a society called Watch, which is wearable technologies in healthcare. We're gonna have our fifth meeting at Stanford this year, and I would welcome any of you uh, to come to Stanford. The other thing, you have my contacts of social media. I'm always, uh, uh, I always like to uh, collaborate as much as I can. I'm a very busy person, but I, I certainly uh, learn more from uh, people like you and uh, patients, entrepreneurs, uh, other physicians than uh, you know, my own experience. And I, once again, I would like to thank Hubert uh, for the opportunity, and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions. Thanks. Yes, so from what I can get from your question is that with there could be lots of innovations going on, but there's going to be some barriers or some regulation that you will have to, you, you will face, uh, and how soon you should address that if you go to, well, we go back to the last, last thing, you know, usually the mindset of a successful entrepreneur, uh, there's a lot of, uh, of them being naive and not knowing about things, and that's that's a blessing in many ways because they just go and do it. And if they get in trouble, they get in trouble. And they, you know, it's it's always better to ask for forgiveness than for permission. Uh, it's th that's unfortunately the mindset that we have. 
and we have to change that a, a little bit. It's difficult in medicine because you know if you are as, if you are an entrepreneur and you ask for money, you say I have had eight startups and I have failed in all of them, but this is the the best one. This is going to happen. They will take you very seriously, probably. That if you are a surgeon and then you tell your patient, well, you know, half of my patients have died when I do this operation, <laughs> but this time is going to be good. It, it, <laughs> It's, it's not the same. So there has to be a, a fine line in those things where you can actually make it better. But, uh, but there's, there's a, a lot of the innovation that happens uh, in the world is, is, is done outside the U.S., let's put it this way, by bright minds who many of them are in the U.S. So you have to, I'm not, I'm not saying you have to abuse the opportunities that you have in other places, but you have to have an open mind of where is going to be the best place for this. And I would say that the most critical thing is not to see if it's going to work, if the, you know, the technology is going to be working well, or if the regulation is going to be available, whatever that may be, is to create an innovative business model, how this will be sustainable and it will make money, I hate to say that, because that's what's going to predict if you're going to be successful or not. Uh, uh, you, you had mentioned and you also showed pictures that you were using the Google Glass. Are you actively using it? And based on your usage, have you given feedback to Google about its weaknesses or very what good. can be improved? So we have, actually we have, you know, at any university, unfortunately you have to have what is called uh, IRBs, uh, Ethical Approval, uh, Institutional Review Board. And we have one for the use of wearable devices in the operating room. So yes, I use that and a number of other things. We really don't use, I mean, we, we explore the, their uses for many different things. Uh, I uh, work with many different startups. Uh, and certainly I have given my, uh, my advice to Google for those things. Um, but it's something that it's, it, it's, it's a work in progress, okay? And it's creating, as I said, something that would give meaningful value. Uh, some people have found some, some value, for example, with people who have uh, uh, problems with uh, dyslexia, more than dyslexia, um, some, you know, some like Alzheimer and other things uh, where you can get a, a, a mental prosthesis by having a, a head mounted displays that it gives you reminders throughout the day. And while there's a lot of criticism behind the use of glass because it really was a big hype, lots of cost and things like that, there's some good value propositions that have made some sense and that uh, will prevail once you make some, some differences. Uh, so, so yes, I mean, we work on those things, uh, not on every patient, not extensively, but with a great number of things. All right, we'll, uh, we'll uh, have to move, move out here. Um, again, thank you uh, for coming. Uh, Dr. Rivas, he will be available outside as well, and we'll uh, let the next panel come in. There is a session uh, this afternoon at 2 p.m. called uh, Health Startups 301, which is life after series one. Lee Nesbitt, uh, Tom White, and Paul Harchman will be speaking. Paul just sold his company for $80 million. Uh, all three are <clears throat> mentors at Health Wildcatters. But you need to hear these stories. Yes, that's a way off. That's, those, are, those weren't generated yesterday, these startups. But they all are serial entrepreneurs in healthcare, very successful. They're here in Dallas making things happen. Uh, this community is growing. and. Um, we're, we're proud of them. Um, there are schedules here for the rest of the healthcare track. Uh, if you don't have one yet, there's still one, two, three, four, five events, uh, or six events, including that one this week. So it's not too late to catch the rest of Health Innovation and Healthcare Startup Week. And with that, again, thanks to Dr. Rivas. Let's give him another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.